Greetings YouTube. Today I'm going to talk about Relics and Rituals Olympus. This is a campaign setting for um, D&D 3.5 um, in the classic Greek era. Bronze Age, Hercules, Perseus, the Trojan Wars, you get the idea. Um, from Swords and Sorcery, which is the subdivision of uh, White Wolf. Now, this is, um, uh, this one right here, I got uh, cheap on uh, Amazon. I think I paid six or seven bucks for it. Even with shipping, it wasn't a whole lot. Um, well worth your time. Um, I think that it's, a, it's an excellent resource. And it has a lot in, in, in uh, similarity to the Excalibur book I recently reviewed for a reason. I mean, they're, they're put forth as a, both similar concepts. I'm kind of sad they didn't get to do more of them. So I think they would have uh, done a good job and it presented a number of other settings in the same way. I happen to like a lot of the stuff that was put out for by Sword and Sorcery. Not everything, but they do do a decent job. So I'm going to run down the uh, uh, the contents as some show notes here. The uh, first chapter we have are the races. And we have humans, and they give the option of playing subdivisions of humans. For example, you could be from a warlike city, or a cursed city, or a well-educated city. And these different places get you different kinds of bonuses. Um, here we go, be a second, I'll show you one of the bonuses. Here we go, like if you're cursed, you have a plus two dex, negative two, two con, and your favorite class is rogue. Um, if you're from a warlike place, plus two con, negative two wisdom, fighter. I mean, things kind of make sense. Now, if you're from an educated city, plus two intelligence, plus two wisdom, negative two strength, preference wizard. Um, and if you're from a mystical, same bonuses, plus two intelligence, plus two wisdom, but a negative two con. Um, and uh, sorcerer is your uh, is your preference. Though, of course, these would work for some kind of priest as well, obviously. Um, then we have the dwarves, and the dwarves are shown here as being the children of, Hep of Hephaestus, the god of smithing, and they get heat resistance as one of their racial characteristics. I don't remember which one they lose for that, but it's about the same power level as another as the older dwarves' uh, stats. Uh, we have elves, two species of elves. One are seafaring elves, not necessarily aquatic elves, but they are. They spend most of their time living on the ocean on ships, and when they do land, land they live on coastal areas and islands and things like that. And the second are more of the classic wild elves. Um, hunters, rangers, um, which I think work well in both cases uh, as being children of the gods. Um, then we have fawns, which are a race of creatures very similar to satyrs. Little horns, cloven foot, you know, the whole nine yards. Um, but a true race with, you know, sexual dimorphism, male, females. Um, we have gnomes, and the gnomes are put forth as scholars. They get a bardic knowledge ability, which I kind of like. They give an illustration of a male doman here that made me think of Aristotle. I saw the picture, I'm like, hey, that looks like Aristotle. Um, half elves, based off of the other elves. Half orcs, barbarians, you know, we, the half orcs don't change a whole lot, but we still end up with the plus two strength and the negative two to two stats, and I've never liked that. I just don't think strength is that big a bonus that it means you should get two negative traits. Um, I just don't, don't agree with that. Um, then we have halflings, and I like the halflings here. They're shown as being children of Hermes, and they have uh, a, a movement of 30. I like the idea of small, fast halflings, very childlike in that way. Um, and being children of Hermes, they would have a very childlike, mischievous attitude, which plays into other halfling stereotypes. Um, then we have the Spartes, which are a race based on the classic Greek myth of the dragon's teeth, uh, which I don't even know if it's a classic Greek myth, I'm not even sure, but it's, it's in the general memory of all gamers, especially from the Harryhausen film. But essentially a race of beings born from dragon teeth, buried in the ground, they rose up as these ultimate warriors, and then they eventually bred true. Um, they can breed with humans, but they only get humans as a result, so they have to breed with each other. And they get a bonus to con, and they get to wisdom. They are essentially Spartans, kind of very tough, but, you know, a little unstable in some ways, you know, kind of willing to throw themselves into things, into battle. Um, but uh, they end up, they get uh, a 
the racial or social uh, preferential proficiency in short spear, javelin, short sword, and shield. So all of them are going to be frontline equipped as frontline troops, not necessarily as frontline troops. But I think inter it would be quite interesting to run one of those as oh, uh, a sorcerer. Um, you know, he's not going to look like a sorcerer, folks. He's definitely going to throw people off. Um, then we have how the existing core classes can be adapted to the Greek culture, uh, how the existing prestige classes can be adopted, um, new prestige classes, and there's a lot of these are all based off of having a distinct attachment to the gods, and I can quite understand that. Well, the one for me that stuck out was the Master uh, Pancratast. Pancratation is the Greek form of martial arts, and it was uh, it was strikes. There was also a lot of body locks, grappling, and breaking limbs, and just holding someone and you crushed them in your arms. You know what I mean? It made me think a lot of how mixed martial arts are done, like those ultimate fight things they do in those octagonal um, arenas and stuff. I think that pancreatitionists would work really well in that kind of fighting style. You get in there, you hit your, your opponent, you grapple them, and you don't let go until you win. Um, then we have skills, feats, and equipment, and some of the feats in here are based on being related to the gods, either a direct child or, or, or you are especially favored by the gods. And they also have uh, feats in here about you know losing that favor and uh, suffering from hubris. And then a section on equipment, the kind of technology you're going to find in the in the Greek era. Um, the list of bar spells, new spell lists updating all the existing spells plus new spells that are from the game and of course listing the new spells themselves. Then we have magic items. And magic items in a Greek setting really, for the most part, are, are going to be seen as gifts from the god. There'd be some minor things, you know, like you know, the alchemy things you don't want to worry about, and some real minor potions and things like that, maybe some scrolls. Those are not going to have to have any connections to the gods. But anything more advanced than that is going to have some kind of connection to the gods. They also say that wands weren't that common, but you could use the wand feet to you know, create wand feet to create any kind of item that you hold or, or wear that was function as, as, as a wand in the same manner. You know, single spell, 50 charges, that kind of thing. Um, they talk about the same way as like rings. Rings were not overly common as far as magic items were concerned like from legend, so they could you know, be a little more flexible on what those items are. Um, they're also talking about some of the artifacts, you know, like the, the, the famous weapons that Perseus used and things like that. Um, then we have some history, mythology, and fantasy elements. The, talking about the land, cosmology, heroism, and hubris, which is a mechanic for keeping track of, do you, are you too arrogant? And if you are, the gods don't like that. You always have to be humble to a certain amount, and that's very important in a Greek setting. Otherwise, the gods are going to step on you. Um, the gods themselves, uh, monsters, how to adapt. Of course, a lot of classic d and monsters are right out of Greek mythology. Centaurs, chimeras, uh, Medusa, Minotaur. They're all right out there, so you can use those without a problem. They also talk about how to adapt other monsters, which are iconic to D&D, to the Greek setting. Like any half-human monster, you've got to fit right in. You don't have to do anything to it. And some ideas of how you can do other things. Um, and they also have an optional defense system, which increases your armor class based on your BAB um, over time. So if you have a full BAB, I think by the 20th level you have a plus 6 or six or 7 to your AC to reflect the fact that a lot of Greek heroes are not wearing a lot of armor. They're just, they were wearing it was lightly armored, and that's the way they fought. Um, then we have actual listings of monsters, for example, uh, Cerberus. Both a epic and a non-epic version, uh, Cyclopses, both uh, the crafter Cyclops and the more savage Cyclops, um, harpies, sirens. Uh, more for, uh, more details on Medusa than you would have found in the standard book. The uh, Nemean lion, um, which uh, Her Hercules was uh, famous for slaying. Um, water nymphs. Uh, I was specifically breaking them down into the subcategories. Like there were what went for rivers and, and for lakes and you know oceans things like that.
Um, so overall, if you want to do a Greek setting, I think this book is going to cover everything you need to know. Now, the one thing I found surprising, there wasn't a prestige class for Hoplite, which is, you know, the classic heavy armored Greek warrior, the, the Spartans, as, as they were in history, as opposed to how they were seen, seen in the uh, graphic novel and uh, the film 300. But I guess, you know, you could use the standard fighter to create a pretty decent uh, hoplite. The one problem I have with that is that in AD and D, or rather, sorry, AD and D, in D and D, um, the spear, the the two-handed spear or the two-handed long spear, are seen as two-handed weapons. When the Spartans use them in one hand with a shield, so I would allow. In fact, I would. Uh, allow this to be in any genre, it isn't just the Greeks, it would culture, I'd any culture to do this. I would allow anyone with martial skills to be able to use a shield and a spear, a regular spear or a long spear, in one hand. Basically you're using your shield to steady it as you're in combat. I wouldn't let you use it without the shield. Um, and that would let you to use a shield and have the spear, and that is how the Greeks fought, folks. Big spears, Sarasa, were 18 feet long, and yet they used them with a spear. Um, and, and they used their spears, they actually strung them from their body. And so the strap would actually kind of hold it like almost a messenger bag in front of them. And they, so they could actually use their both hands on the thing while still holding the shaft, while still holding up their shields. That's one style of fighting. Um, but, but if you can't use a shield and a spear, then you're not going to be able to emulate a true Greek warrior, and you need to do that to get that iconic hoplite shield wall, you know, marching towards the enemy. Uh, but overall, an excellent book, well worth your time, especially if you can get it at a decent rate like I did. Um, and I hope that you get some use out of it and some enjoyment, because I had a good time reading it.